Sutra, Disciples of the Buddha, what constitutes the Bodhisattva Mahasattva's patience in perceiving all and secondary effects? Disciples of the Buddha, this Bodhisattva Mahasattva knows that all worldly phenomena resemble conjured effects. That is, all sentient beings meant to these resemble conjured effects for they result from awareness and thoughts. All worldly activities resemble conjured effects for they result from discriminations or misinterpretations and of suffering and happiness resemble conjured effects for they result from delusive craving. All unreal worldly dramas resemble conjured effects for they manifest through language and speech and all afflictions and distinctions resemble conjured effects for the result from cognition. Commentary Universal Worthy Bodhisattva calls out again, Disciples of the Buddha, what constitutes the Bodhisattva Mahasattva's patience in perceiving all as conjured effects? Disciples of the Buddha, this Bodhisattva Mahasattva knows that all worldly phenomena resemble conjured effects for their unreal, that is, all sentient beings' mental deeds resemble conjured effects, for they result from awareness and thoughts. All beings' mental karma is impure and thus subject to change. For example, we think about doing something today but change our mind by tomorrow. Today we wish to live the home life and cultivate the Bodhi path. Tomorrow we want to return to lay life and get married. Thus, our mental karma is like a marriage. Our mind is not firm. Lacking samadhi, we waver and change according to whatever thoughts we happen to have in a given moment. This type of mental activity or awareness is the root of all evil because it is not a wholesome awareness. Rather, it is deluded awareness. It wants to know how to be ignorant, how to fall into the house, and how to break the rules. This deluded mental awareness is known as the wrong understanding and wrong view. This wrong understanding and wrong view leads you to such confusion that it is as if you were upside down instead of right side down, right side up. Therefore, it is not easy to cultivate the path to Buddhahood. We cultivators must clearly recognize the six steps, i.e. Eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. We definitely should not run around with these thieves because they would create a lot of trouble for us, causing us to be afflicted and ignorant. Instead, we need to have the right understanding and right view. If we constantly think about how to undertake our spiritual practice and realize the path, this kind of mental awareness is the right understanding and the right view. With the right understanding and right view, we will be able to remain detached and not take everything to heart. By not clinging to on to anything, we can maintain a mind that is unimpeded. If we only think about the wrong understanding and wrong view, we can't be our own master because we allow our internal and external states to influence us. Our, once our mind is afflicted by these days, we become confused as if we were upside down. Everyone pays special attention to this. Don't let this influence you. Rather, you need to influence these days. This is the key to cultivation. All worldly activities resemble conjured effects for the result from discriminations. All the transformation-like activities in the world consist of the activities of all sentient beings. Why are there so many different activities in the world? They are created by the distinction-making minds of beings. All misinterpretations of suffering and happiness resemble conjured effects for the result from the elusive craving. Sentient beings treat suffering as if it were happiness, and happiness as if it were suffering. Actually, seeking happiness is the cause of suffering, and suffering is the result of seeking happiness. Therefore, cultivators of the path 
should undertake appropriate ascetic practices, for that can lead to attain true future happiness. The four virtues of nirvana, i.e., permanence, bliss, true self, and purity. Although those who don't engage in self-cultivation enjoy temporary happiness, they end up undergoing suffering in the long run. Why do people? Why do beings fall into the hells? They hunger after worldly pleasures. Pleasures. Why do beings ascend to the heavens? They endure suffering and challenges during their self-cultivation. Unfortunately, sentient beings don't understand these principles and continue to engage in deluded acts. They only crave temporary pleasure instead of seeking to realize everlasting happiness. Being confused, they are unwilling to tolerate. Temporary suffering, but are willing to endure long-term suffering. This is what is meant by all misinterpretations of suffering and happiness resemble marriages, treating the false as true and the true as false, mistaking the work love for your tried. All of these are caused by delusive craving for what we deem. We deem as a pleasure, a pleasurable. All unreal worldly dramas resemble conjured effects, for they manifest through language and speech. All things in the world are unreal, for they are all illusory transformations. Since all phenomena are made real by descriptive words, they are not the ultimate reality. And all afflictions and distinctions resemble marriages. For the result from cognition, people chase after afflictions. Once we have afflictions, we start making distinctions. Once we make distinctions, we have afflictions. Where do afflictions come from? They arise from deluded thinking. Once that once there is deluded thinking, the process of making distinctions begins. Therefore, both afflictions and distinctions come from our thoughts. Sutra. Furthermore, the purifying and taming of sentient beings resembles a conjured effect, for it manifests from non-discrimination. The Bodhisattva's steadfastness thorough throughout the three periods of time resembles a conjured effect, for it is due to impartiality, premised or non-arising. The Bodhisattva's vow power resembles a conjured effect, for it is established through extensive cultivation. The third common great compassion resembles a conjured effect, for it is manifested by expediency, and the provisional turning of the Dharma wheel resembles a conjured effect, for it is expressed with eloquence arising from wisdom and fearlessness. Such is the Bodhisattva's understanding of worldly and transcendental conjured effects. His understanding, which is based on direct experience, extensive knowledge, valid knowledge, factual knowledge, sovereign knowledge, and genuine knowledge, cannot be swayed swayed by delusive views. Nor does he conduct with conforms to worldly conventions, contravening the truth. Commentary. Furthermore, the purifying and taming, teaching and rescuing of sentient beings resembles a conjured effect, for it manifests from a mind of non-discrimination. The Bodhisattva's steadfastness throughout the three periods of time resembles a conjured effect, for it is due to impartiality, premised on premised on non-arising. Why is there marriage like? Trainlessness throughout the three periods of time. This is due to equality of non-arising. The Bodhisattva's vow power resembles a conjured effect, for it is established through extensive cultivation. Bodhisattvas use great vows and great power to teach and transform sentient beings. How do they attain such great vows and great power? They have brought forth. A great resource for body and diligently cultivate the path. The third common great compassion resembles a conjured effect, for it is manifested by expediency. 
the Bodhisattva, the, the Buddha has great compassion. He uses a myriad of skillful experience to rescue sentient beings from suffering, to teach and transform them, and to cause them to bring forth the Bodhi resolve and cultivate the unsurpassed path leading to Buddhahood. And the provisional turning of the Dharma wheel resembles a conjured effect, for it is expressed with eloquence arising from wisdom and fearlessness. The Buddhas and Bodhisattvas turn the wonderful Dharma wheel as an expedient to teach and transform sentient beings. Only those with great wisdom can turn the Dharma wheel. In addition, you need a spirit of great fearlessness in order to attain eloquence without obstruction. You then can explain the sutras and speak the drama and help all beings receive the benefits of the Buddha drama. Such is the Bodhisattva's understanding of worldly and transcendental conjured effects. His understanding, which is based on direct experience, extensive knowledge, valid knowledge, factual knowledge, sovereign knowledge, and genuine knowledge cannot be swayed or otherwise affected by delusive views, nor does his conduct, which conforms to worldly conventions, contravene the truth. Although a Bodhisattva handles all worldly affairs in accordance with customs and conventions, he does not go against the truth of underlying principles. He is able to conform to the specific matters without hindering the principles and conforms to the principles without hindering the specific matters. In this way, the specifics and the principles are seamlessly integrated without contradiction. Since the true and the false are non-dual, the Bodhisattva does not contravene the truth. The words contravening can be interpreted as not contravening worldly conventions. Thus, the principle, the truth, is not apart from worldly conventions. Not contravening also can mean not contravening the truth, hence the principle, worldly conventions are not apart from the truth. Sutra, consider the analogy of a conjured effect that arises neither from the mind nor from mental dramas nor from karma. It is not subject to retribution. It neither is born in the world nor perishes in the world. It cannot be pursued or grasped. It dwells neither for a long term nor for a brief instant. It neither traverses the world nor departs from the world. It is not bound exclusively to one location, nor does it belong to every location. It is neither measurable nor immeasurable. It neither grows weary and rests, nor is indefatigable. It is neither mortal nor divine, neither defined nor pure. It undergoes neither birth nor death. It is neither wisdom nor foolishness. It is neither visible nor invisible. It neither relies on the mundane nor enters the Dharma realm. It is neither intelligent nor dull-witted. There is nothing to grasp at or relinquish. It is neither subject to birth and death nor in Nirvana. It neither exists nor does not exist. The Bodhisattva travels through worlds in this skillful, expedient manner, cultivating the Bodhisattva path well versed in the dramas of all worlds. He sends transformation bodies to them. He is attached neither to the mundane nor to his own body. He does not discriminate with regard to the world or his body. He neither dwells in the world nor is apart from the world. He neither dwells in the drama nor is apart from the drama. Due to his vast past vows, he does not forsake a single realm of sentient beings, nor does he regulate only a few realms of sentient beings. He neither distinguishes among dramas nor fails to distinguish among them. He knows that the drama nature neither comes nor goes. Although there is nothing to eat, he still fills sentient beings with the Buddha drama. He understands that dramas are like conjured effects, neither existent nor non-existent. Commentary. Consider the analogy 
of a conjured effect that arises neither from the mind nor from mental dramas nor from karma. Conjured effects can undergo limitless changes. Something gets transformed into nothing, and nothing gets transformed into something. Although it is the mind that is causing these changes, the changes themselves are not the mind. Therefore, it is said that a conjured effect does not arise from the mind. It is not subject to retribution. It neither is born in the world nor perishes in the world. It cannot be pursued or grasped, since the originally conjured effects do not exist. They cannot be sought after or grasped. It dwells neither for a long term nor for a brief instant. It neither traverses the world nor nor departs from the world. It is not bound exclusively to one location, nor does it belong to every location. It is neither measurable nor immeasurable. It neither grows weary and rests, nor is it indefatigable and does not rest. It is neither mortal like ordinary people nor divine like the sages. It is neither a divine drama. Nor a pure drama. It undergoes neither birth nor death. It is neither wisdom nor foolishness. It is neither visible nor invisible. It neither relies on the mundane nor enters the drama realm. It is neither intelligent nor dull-witted. There is nothing to grasp at or relinquish. It is neither subject to birth and death nor in nirvana. It neither exists nor does not exist. The Bodhisattva travels through worlds in this skillful, expedient manner, cultivating the Bodhisattva path with qualities like a conjured effect. A Bodhisattva uses the myriad of skillful expedients and cultivates the Bodhisattva path throughout the worlds. While versed in the dramas of all worlds, he sends transformation bodies to them. By thoroughly understanding the dramas of all worlds, he can send transformation bodies. To Buddha lands in the ten directions. In these worlds of the ten directions, he is attached neither to the mundane nor to his own body. He does not discriminate with regard to the world or his body. A Bodhisattva no longer has any attachment to the self and dharmas. Therefore, he does not differentiate between worldly dharmas and his body. He neither dwells in the world nor is apart from the world. He neither dwells in drama, drama nor is apart from drama. Due to the power of his past vows, he does not forsake a single realm of sentient beings, nor does he regulate only a few realms of sentient beings. He neither distinguishes among dramas nor fails to distinguish among them. He knows that the drama nature has no substance of its own, and thus it neither comes nor goes. Although there is nothing to eat. He still fills sentient beings with the Buddha drama, knowing that the drama nature cannot be obtained. The Bodhisattva still uses skillful means to teach the wondrous drama spoken by all Buddhas, causing all beings to be filled with the drama. He understands the principle that dramas are like conjured effects and illusions, neither existent nor non-existent. Sutra, disciples of the Buddha. When the Bodhisattva Mahasattva abides in the patience of perceiving all as conjured effects in this way, he can fulfill the path of body cultivated by all Buddhas and bring benefit to all beings. This is called patience in perceiving all as conjured effects, the ninth kind of patience of a Bodhisattva Mahasattva. When the Bodhisattva achieves this patience, everything he does resembles a conjured effect. He does not rely on any Buddha land, cling to any worldly thing, or make distinctions within the Buddha drama. Yet he proceeds toward the Buddha's body without weariness, cultivates the Bodhisattva practices, and renounces all confusion. Though he has no body, he manifests every kind of body. Though he has no abode, he dwells in every land. Though he has no form, he manifests every form. Though he is not attached to reality, he clearly perceives the impartial and perfect drama nature. Commentary: Disciples of the Buddha, 
When the Bodhisattva Mahasattva abides in the patience of in perceiving all as conjured effects in this way, he can fulfill the path of Bodhi, the path of enlightenment cultivated by all Buddhas, and bring benefit to all beings. This is called patience in perceiving all as conjured effects, the ninth kind of patience of a Bodhisattva Mahasattva. When the Bodhisattva achieves this patience, everything he, do he does resembles a conjured effect. With this attainment, the Bodhisattva is unattached and unaffected by any states. He does not rely on any Buddha, any Buddha land. Why? Because he understands lands are mere conjured effects, so there is nothing to rely on or abide in. He does not cling to any worldly thing. Since he understands that all worldly things are merely conjured effects, there is nothing to get at or attached to. He does not make the distinctions within the Buddha drama, yet he proceeds toward the Buddha's body without weariness. A Bodhisattva is not like us ordinary pupil, for we only cultivate for a couple of days and when we don't see results right away, we either give up or slack off. Everyone should understand that if we don't cultivate, we won't achieve anything. As the saying goes, when a man cultivates, he realizes the path. When a woman cultivates, he she realizes the path. In other words, whoever is willing to cultivate wholeheartedly, that person will reach the shore of liberation. He cultivates the Bodhisattva practices and renounces all confusion. We too need to cultivate the Bodhisattva practices in order to abandon all our distorted dreamlike thinking. Though he has no body, a Bodhisattva sees the emptiness of self and dramas, therefore he is neither attached to the self nor to dramas. Since he is not attached to the self, he doesn't have a body, yet even without a body, he still manifests every kind of body. Though he has no abode, he dwells in every Buddha land of the ten directions. Though he has no attachment to any form, he manifests every form. Though he is not attached, to reality, he clearly perceives the impartial and perfect Dharma nature. A Bodhisattva has swept away all Dharmas and left behind all marks. Therefore, he is not attached to the principles of ultimate reality. Yet, with the bright light of wisdom, he clearly understands that the Dharma nature is impartial and perfect. Sutra, Disciples of the Buddha since this Bodhisattva Mahasattva does not rely on any drama whatsoever, he is named the Liberated One. Having cast out all forms, he is named the Disciplined One. Unwavering and unflinching, he pervasively enters the assemblies of all thus commons and is known as one with spiritual powers. Having attained skillful means with regard to the non-arising of dramas, he is named the non-retreating one, endowed with such powers that even Sumeru and the Iron Ring Mountains cannot obstruct him. He is named the unobstructed one. Commentary Disciples of the Buddha, since this Bodhisattva Mahasattva does not rely on any dharma whatsoever, he is named the liberated one. Having cast out all four, are you willing to renounce all your forms and, or are you unwilling to renounce even one of them? Do you wish to continue being so selfish, self-benefiting, jealous and unobstructive? Are jealousy and unobstructiveness forms? Tell me, if so, then why don't you give up them? Then why don't you give them up? Why do you want to keep them and protect them? Person, I want to renounce them. Then, why do you still have them inside? Ask yourself that, unless you are they are stupid, no one would refuse to give up their phones. He's named the disciplined one. What has the disciplined and subdued? He has tamed his body and mind, renouncing arrogance, ignorance, afflictions, and an ego as big as Mount Sumeru. Such a one is disciplined. Do you understand? If you haven't renounced these forms, 
you cannot be called that a disciplined one has relinquished all his faults unwavering and unflinching he progressively enters the assemblies of all thus come ones he sits there unwavering not moving in the least he wouldn't flinch even if his legs hurt or his back ached you see the text says unwavering unwavering and unflinching if you can be that way then you can progressively go to the assemblies and bodhimandas of all first come ones this is known as providing the ten directions without moving from one's place without leaving his seat this bodhisattva can roam throughout the buddha lands of the ten directions to attend drama assemblies and he is known as one with spiritual powers this is a bodhisattva endowed with spiritual powers having attained skillful means with regard to the non arising of dharmas he is named the non retreating one this bodhisattva sees not the slightest drama arise not the slightest drama perish having realized patience with a state of mind in which no mental objects arise he can endure such a state in his mind having attained skillful means this bodhisattva has already attained the position in his cultivation where he can use expedient means to teach and transform sentient beings and not retreat from anuttara samyak sambuddhi endowed with such powers that even sumeru and the iron ring mountains cannot obstruct him he is named the unobstructed one the bodhisattva is endowed with every kind of power including the ten powers of the buddha therefore the two great mountains mount sumeru and the iron ring mountains cannot obstruct him since even these mountains cannot hinder the bodhisattva's powers he is given the special name the unobstructed one no material is too solid or adamantine for him to smash and penetrate hence his name this bodhisattva has no obstructions